Hello. Hi, everyone. Ciao. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome to another episode of Das Criminal. I'm Erin, by the way. Yeah, in case you haven't figured this out, she's Erin and I'm Amr. And we're your two favorite podcast hosts. Before we jump into it, we once again want to shout out Palestine, our solidarity with Palestine right now. If you're interested in learning more about Palestine, there's a great website you can check out called decolonizepalestine.com. I think there's a lot of resources out there. I understand that some people aren't as informed as they should be, but ignorance is no excuse at this point. And there is ample resources, both in terms of websites, articles, and even books, uh, really good books by both Jewish scholars and Palestinian scholars about the occupation. Let's pivot to our topic for today. Which is? Marie Antoinette. Yeah, actually, it's a good pronunciation. It's Marie Antoinette, yeah. <laughs> who is a really attractive woman that... I, res- I respect women, you know, as, as a woman respecter, I respect all women, including monarchs. Sofia Coppola's 2006 film, Marie Antoinette, starring Kirsten Dunst, features the young queen dancing around the palace to tracks by The Cure and Bow Wow Wow. She is beautiful, surrounded by the world's finest luxuries at that time, partying and gossiping with her aristocratic friends. The film is, in essence, the girl bossification of Marie Antoinette. Okay, tangent, Kristen Dunst was one of my first celeb crushes, and that's thanks to Sam Raimi's Spider-Man movie, so respect there. At the same time, however, France's peasants suffered. The population had increased rapidly over the last century, so many people were unable to find work. Bad harvest led to a shortage of food and an increase in prices. While the royals ate lavishly in their palace at Versailles, the commoners struggled to survive. But if you search for biographies of Marie Antoinette, most of them focus on her fashion sense, her romantic relationships, and even how some of the French tabloids published misleading stories about her, such as the infamous Let Them Eat Cake line and the Diamond Necklace Affair. It's almost as though nearly 230 years after her execution, we're meant to believe that Marie Antoinette was a victim of the French Revolution rather than a symbol of its grievances in the first place. So why has Marie Antoinette's image been sanitized in recent years? Was she simply a misunderstood aristocrat born in the wrong place at the wrong time? Or have we perhaps been buying into some counter-revolutionary revisionism? In this episode, we're going to briefly discuss the life and death of Marie Antoinette and why the French revolutionaries thought it was necessary to kill the royals. If you're interested in a detailed history about the French Revolution, Mike Duncan does a great job in his third season of the Revolutions podcast. It's way, way, way more thorough than we could ever hope to be. Oh yeah, the Revolutions podcast is fantastic. The current season is on the Russian Revolution and it's brilliant. Yeah, can't recommend that enough. So if you're looking for a thorough breakdown of the French Revolution, please look there first. Don't look at us. (laughs) So Marie Antoinette was born Maria Antonia Josepha Johanna on November 2nd, 1955 in Vienna, Austria. She was the youngest daughter of Empress Maria Theresa of the Habsburg Empire and as the only unmarried daughter when France and Austria wanted to secure their new alliance with the royal wedding, was married off at 14 years old to Louis XVI, the Dauphin of France. Dauphin is a French term for crown prince. The French are really particular about keeping all of their terms French. It's why Maria Antonia had to change her name to Marie Antoinette. Yeah, so Dauphin actually comes from the French word for dolphin, Dauphin, which was the sort of sigil or symbol of the French heir apparent. So the French crown princes are basically called the dolphin, if you didn't know that. That's a bit weird. Yeah. Dolphins are mean and aggressive, so I'm just Oh yeah, they saying. they murder other fish for fun, not like for food or anything, just for fun. They're sickos. Just like French royalty, which we'll get <laughs> into in a second. So when Louis XV died in 1774, Louis XVI ascended to the French throne, making Marie Antoinette the Queen of France. 
Marie Antoinette and her husband Louis represented all the excesses of the royal family that the French populace hated. Though France's debt was more due to the wars waged by the likes of previous kings than Marie Antoinette spending at Versailles, it didn't help that she dined on expensive food when people were starving, and covered herself in costly clothes when other people were selling their teeth to afford shoes. So if you've seen one of the many adaptations of Les Miserables, the original source being Victor Hugo's novel, or screenplay, or whatever you want to call it, it paints a harrowing portrait of the immiseration of the French poor. And yeah, that's exactly what Erin said. Poor people had to sell their teeth to survive. There was rampant child prostitution. And all the while, the French aristocracy were gorging themselves on caviar and other luxurious foodstuffs and drinking the finest wines and so on. So you might have read that it became fashionable to blame Marie Antoinette for all of France's problems, even those like the expenses of the American Revolution, which France supported. But I don't think we should view this as something stupid on the part of the French. From a Marxist perspective, even though Marx wasn't yet born at the time of the French Revolution, so we obviously have to look at this in retrospect, France was ripe for political change. The first and second estate, the Catholic Church and nobility, owned lots of land in France, but generally did not have to pay taxes on their wealth. Meanwhile, the peasants, who didn't have such access to the means of production, labored away so the fat cats could live in luxury. Yeah, so this was also the time in which the process of enclosure was nearing completion, which was basically the displacement of peasant populations from their communal lands and the consequent move to cities in order to create a docile labor force in urban centers, which basically facilitates the Industrial Revolution and the birth of capitalism. Silvia Federici's Caliban and the Witch does a great job of covering this process, especially in medieval France and late medieval France. In other words, previous generations of serfs and peasantry would retain some communal land in which, you know, they'll spend part of the week working for their lord and part of the week working their communal lands for sustenance. But the process of enclosure meant that those communal lands were slowly partitioned off to landowners, rich landowners, the lords, the aristocracy. And once they became private property of the aristocracy and the clergy, those peasants had no means of creating their own survival, of growing their own food and so on. And so those peasants ended up flocking to these urban centers and basically becoming wage laborers in which, you know, they'd work for some amount of money. And the city could not absorb such large numbers. And it was deliberate also because capitalism requires a reserve force of unemployed workers to allow the capitalists to suppress wages. And that contributed heavily to these conditions. So as Amr just alluded to, there were a number of problems that led to the French Revolution, enough that they're still debated to this day. So we're not going to discuss the whole thing in detail, but let's touch on a few. Of course, you have that economic hardship. The agrarian crisis of 1788 and 89 in particular causes food shortages and hastens the revolution. Despite a rising middle class, France had major economic disparities. The nobility and the merchant class enjoyed luxuries at the expense of the peasants. You also had social antagonism. There was discontent rising between the old nobility and the rising bourgeoisie. In the early days of the revolution, Marie Antoinette and her family tried to flee France in a failed escape known as the Flight of Varan. It's mad to me that the French, who at this point really disliked the royals, captured them and brought them back to Versailles, where they eventually were held by the National Guard. Why wouldn't you just, like, let them abdicate? Why would you force them to govern? I suppose the converse is that letting them flee would be counter to them facing some form of justice. And I don't think this was the motivation for them being captured after the flight of Varan, but I do think that a simple abdication would not have pleased anyone, both the royalists on one side and the radicals on the other. And also, I think at this point in France, the early days were such that the focus was on reform within a monarchy, not the abolishment of the monarchy. Right. I suppose at this point, support for the monarchy was low, but most people, aside from the more radical factions of the revolution, didn't want it totally abolished. But of course, that number would end up growing. Yeah, exactly. So it's important to recognize that in its infancy, the French Revolution flummoxed between reformation and abolition. 
As we now know, it would eventually lean toward the latter, with the more radical components of the French Revolution purging those they considered counter-revolutionaries during the Reign of Terror. In June of 1972, a mob was able to break into the palace and eventually capture the king and queen, who tried, unsuccessfully again, to flee. King Louis XVI was tried in December for treason and executed in January of 1793 by guillotine. Marie Antoinette now found herself imprisoned in the Petit Tour at Le Temple Prison with little support in France aside from conservative and wealthy individuals. They tried several times to facilitate her escape, but these plots failed. After the Girondins, the moderate faction of the revolution, lost power, Marie Antoinette didn't appear to have much hope. Marie Antoinette was tried by the Revolutionary Tribunal on October 14, 1793, with, among other things, orchestrating orgies in Versailles. You heard it here, folks. The French Revolution is anti-polyamory, and so it's (laughs) cancelled. Sending millions of leaves of treasury money to Austria. Planning the massacre of the Gare Francais, the National Guards, in 1792. Declaring her son to be the new king of France. And incest. She did not respond to this charge and was not convicted of it. Most historians agree that it was fabricated to humiliate her. Yeah, but to be fair, she's a Habsburg, and if they were known for one thing, it's convoluted family trees that looked more like constellations than actual trees. Two days later, Marie Antoinette was convicted of depletion of the national treasury, conspiracy against the internal and external security of the state, and high treason because of her intelligence activities in the interest of the enemy. As a result, Marie Antoinette was sentenced to death. That same day, prison guards cut her hair and tied her hands behind her back. They carried her in an open carriage to the guillotine, so angry French people could jeer at her. Yeah, see, I don't get that, because it's one thing to, like, you know, sentence a figure of reactionary politics or bourgeois sort of decadence or whatever to death. But, like, is the humiliation really necessary? It feels rather excessive and sadistic to me. Yeah, I feel stuck on this as well. And it's also worth noting that she was subjected to this, but her husband, the king, was not. Yeah, which shows, Yeah, I think it shows a certain strand of uh, xenophobia within the French Revolution that sort of saw her as an outsider, a foreigner, one worthy of degradation. Right, she was always seen as an Austrian in the palace. She was never really yeah. accepted as French. Yeah. Unlike her deceased husband, Marie Antoinette did not give a short speech when approaching the guillotine. Reportedly, her last words were, Pardonnez-moi, monsieur. Je ne l'ai pas fait d'esprit. Or, pardon me, sir, I did not do it on purpose, after accidentally stepping on the executioner's foot. Uh, I don't know. I feel like if I was being led to the execution, I'd be petty enough to, like, intentionally step on the executioner's foot, like, one last laugh before I die. Yeah, stompity stomp. Yeah. At 12.15pm that day, Marie Antoinette was beheaded. So, of course, we have to ask, why? This seems to be one of the most pervasive questions of the French Revolution. Why execute Marie Antoinette? But I think we're missing a lot of the bigger picture. The so-called reign of terror sought to revolutionize France, to cull the moderates and leave only radicals to reshape the new, enlightened country. Marie Antoinette represented the conservatives and royalists in the country. Revolutionaries often find it necessary to purge the royal family so that nobody else can lay claim to the throne. This was the case with the Romanovs. The flip side of this can be seen in the case of Italy, where the royal house of Savoy was allowed to abdicate when Italy became a republic after World War II. Now there's some celebrity sort of paparazzi gossip over some asinine dispute within the family over who's the current nominal heir. And last I checked, the current Savoy heir is Princess Vittoria di Savoia, who's like this Instagram influencer teen. Um, This, like, TikTok teen who lives in Paris with her dad, who's a prince of Savoie. That's so strange. Yeah, she has, like, 30,000 followers on Instagram, which is hilarious to me. Also, yeah, like, they all live in France for some reason. Because they're in exile. (laughs) Yeah, and up until, like, the 1990s, her dad wasn't allowed back into Italy. I think now he is, but they just live in France. You know, they're very rich. Uh, They're, like, multimillionaires. I think the dad married some French actress, which is how the daughter is here. And now she's like the heir apparent of the defunct Italian throne. And also a TikTok teen. So, you know, don't let your dreams be dreams. 
in less absurd examples, the exile of the Pahlavis from Iran following the 1979 revolution led to this constant insufferable annoyance of this guy, Prince Reza Pahlavi, uh, who I suggest you should Google because his head is massive. It's like Jupiter. It's like fucking the, the, the Easter Island heads. And it, he's the son of the deposed Mohammed Reza Shah. And he sort of just shuffles around in America, in LA, giving interviews about the state of Iran, even though he has no political power or base of support whatsoever. Right. But that is obviously his claim to be some sort of authority on the subject, which is ironic because, of course, we shouldn't be listening to the deposed ruler to tell us why he should be the ruler again. Yeah. And it's funny because, you know, he hasn't lived in Iran since he was like a child. And yet somehow he's like, the Iranian people want this and the Iranian people want that. And it's like, fuck you. How do you know what the Iranian people want? Yeah, the Iranian people specifically got your family out. Yeah. I'm arguing here that Marie Antoinette wasn't merely a scapegoat for France's problems. She was one of the highest class members of society who literally used her power to defend that class. Sophie Vonich gives us a hint in her book, In Defense of the Terror. Quote, It remains to be understood how this movement of enthusiasm that demanded vengeance did not produce a fury of destruction in the sense of a generalized massacre, but it led to the establishment of a specific mechanism that aimed, on the contrary, to pacify it. The assembly must translate the emotions of the sovereign people, end quote. Yeah, and on that note, I want to quote the architect of the terror and someone I admire greatly, Maximilien Robespierre, when he said, quote, The basis of popular government in time of revolution is both virtue and terror. Terror without virtue is murderous. Virtue without terror is powerless. Terror is nothing else than swift, severe, indomitable justice. It flows then from virtue. End quote. Despite what its critics might believe, the terror wasn't simply random acts of violence against perceived counter revolutionaries. It actually had a purpose in driving the will of the people forward. This isn't to say that the French Revolution was peasant led because it wasn't but that public opinion and the sentiments of the masses did play a role in its history. Marie Antoinette wasn't merely a symbol of the problems of the French monarchy. She was a direct part of it. All evidence shows that she used the agency she had to support the gluttonous nobles and quell revolutionary activity. I want to give a note here on historical revisionism and what that term actually means, because I see people using it a lot, particularly Marxist-Leninists, which we should be, of course, like pointing these things out when they're there. But there might be some confusion about what we're talking about. So historical revisionism, in short, is challenging orthodox views of history. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it becomes harmful when people attempt to deny historical facts to supplement a contemporary political movement. A very well-known example of this is Holocaust denial. It is both historically false because the Holocaust did happen, and destructive to modern liberation movements as it paints Holocaust victims, survivors, and their descendants out to be liars. When we critique historical revisionism in the negative sense, we're talking about rewriting history to assuage guilt from the oppressors, and that is bad. And in my argument, that is what has happened with Marie Antoinette. I also want to talk about the girl bossification of women capitalists. Why do we want to see Marie Antoinette in this new light? Is this because it's true or because we don't like the idea that even seemingly obtuse wealthy people could be intimately involved in upholding oppressive structures? Ignorance isn't an excuse for reactionary policies. And in Marie Antoinette's case, she wasn't even ignorant. She had the best education available at the time and chose to hoard wealth. Being a woman isn't an excuse for me either. Like, why would it be? That is so silly. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that it's both correct that Marie Antoinette, as a woman, faced obstacles that her male noble counterparts of a similar rank did not. But at the same time, her position within the class struggle and, and within the hierarchy of French class pyramid, as, as you know, she's the queen and thus an aristocrat, meant that she she's fundamentally exploitative of the working class and, you know, actively detrimental to the well-being of the poor masses. And I think it's also interesting in some cases that the vilification of Marie Antoinette is often used as a tool to absolve or minimize the role of Louis XVI in France's situation at the time, 
which is a common trope among, you know, royal apologists or less radical elements. Essentially, the idea goes that Louis had no idea what was going on in France, and Marie Antoinette and the nobles sort of conspired to keep him ignorant of the true immiseration of the French masses. And this is something similar to what is also seen with apologists for Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, where in the 1905 revolution, for example, before 1917, the driving force was a reformist movement that sought to make Nicholas II aware of the immiserations of the Russian people. A sort of misunderstanding of Nicholas II's role in this. The idea was that, you know, he's surrounded by advisors who give him bad advice instead of recognizing his crucial role in this system of exploitation. Well, interestingly enough, we were just talking about Fidel Castro for our bonus episode this month. And Castro comes from the landowning class, but essentially turned on them and led a revolution against them. Now, I'm not saying obviously it's easy to do that, but it's been done before. Yeah, I mean, the famous anarchist Peter Kropotkin was born into a noble family and uh, he became a radical anarchist and skewed all his titles and his wealth in order to fight for anarchism, which, you know, I have problems with the ideology, but I respect his commitment to the struggle. And I think it's not impossible to want or hope for people who are born into wealth or privilege to identify or sympathize with or empathize with, you know, the exploited, the oppressed and dispossessed, and to commit what essentially constitutes as class suicide to join the struggle. I think the rehabilitation of Marie Antoinette's image, or at least the sort of victimization as a collateral of the French Revolution, I think it's also a reflection of modern anxieties of the capitalist class, like, you know, Yes, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's a fear that this might happen again. So it's like, hey, that was excessive what you did back then. Don't do it again. Yeah, and I think it's even excusing ourselves a bit because it's obvious to look at this person who lives in luxury, who obviously espouses what we would call greed and be like, ooh, that's bad. But then when we see how people respond to it, we want to revise that position and be like, oh, haha, she's not so bad. She doesn't know any better. But greed is such a base emotion. Like, of course, you know better. Yeah. And, you know, it's very difficult for me to sympathize with her, even like not knowing the true immiseration of the people of the peasantry or what have you, or the urban poor. Like, surely, surely there's some level where you're like, this is excessive. Like, I don't need a dress every single day of the week and do dress or whatever, or like all these diamonds or what have you. Right. And we actually don't need, arguably, at least in the West, in the imperial core, we really don't need most of the consumer products that we have. Yeah, that, that, that's also, I think, a reflection of the anxieties of not just the capitalist class today, but general society. And that the idea that Marie Antoinette was executed also for her consumerism is a fear because, you know, there's an underlying anxiety that we know that our, our lifestyles aren't sustainable and that if we were to have any hope of establishing a more egalitarian society, a worldwide egalitarian society that, you know, doesn't just hide the exploitation in another country or export that exploitation to another country or region, that we, mu- we must have a less consumerist, a more sustainable uh an anti-growth economy, if you will, you know, an economy that doesn't rely on cheap but mass-produced items and something that a lot of people, even leftists, and I think a lot of leftists who are like on the whole, like, you know, fully automated luxury communism train really don't recognize is that we don't have the capacity to have that, I think. There is an important recognition that our quality of life, our standard of living must be adjusted if we're to combat climate change and political and economic inequity. And that's something that I think is reflected in the Marie Antoinette story because they shouldn't have killed her because, you know, she was she couldn't have known better or whatever. And it's like, no, she did. She's very much culpable for her excesses. Yeah, I totally agree. And I also think some of this revisionism focuses on her not being necessarily responsible for the crimes of her husband. And I agree in that women or any person is not responsible for the actions of another person. 
But even just holding her accountable for her own actions, her own greed, and her own position in a system that did rely on exploited peasant labor and her (laughs) continuous willingness to defend that. She was known as Madame Vito because every time even Louis tried to institute reforms, especially those that would tax the nobles more, it was Marie Antoinette who was like, no. No, no, s'il vous plaît, no. That's that's Marie Antoinette for you. (laughs) It's like that tweet that's like, I don't support all women. Some of you are greedy. Like some of you are capitalists. Some of you are racists. You can be a woman and also not be a good person. Yeah, I don't think some broad-based gender solidarity is good in a way that's, you know, productive without understanding various other systems of exploitation. Yeah, and I think the girl bossification of now imperialism is one of the worst things we've seen in like the past oh, it's awful. 20 years, maybe? Yeah, yeah, it's awful. I think it's like the girl bossification and like, the queer, the queer type, like the sort of like queer bosses and queer soldiers and, you know, everything is queer coded and what have you. And it's fucking making me want to blow my brains out. Yeah. Homo nationalism. Yeah. In case it wasn't clear, I completely support the beheading of royals. <laughs> and I think they did a great thing in France and other countries should learn from that. Well, I think, too, we can view things with respect to time. And damn, if you were disliked in France, guillotine for you. Yeah, which is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, a pretty civil way to execute reactionaries. I should probably say I oppose the death penalty for many reasons. But it's different to oppose the death penalty as in the state executing people, specifically a state like the United States, which is an imperialist and racist state. And then to talk about the execution of Marie Antoinette in 1793. Oh, yeah, I agree. And I think personally, I would take it one step further and say there's a distinct difference between the sort of the state practicing capital punishment for like, you know, civil or crimes that are individualized, uh, what have you and sort of revolutionary death penalties, which is to say that the death penalties that are given to counter-revolutionary or reactionary elements during a revolutionary process, you know, like uh, Marie Antoinette or the Romanovs or what have you. I I think that it's not pleasant. I don't think I would have take pleasure in it or, or some sort of like sadistic enjoyment out of it. But I think it's necessary to, like we said in the episode, to apply the will of the sovereign people on the enemies of the people. Yes, but I also don't know how I would feel about people voting like for my execution. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I trust the people to like me. I-, I trust myself to be a charmer and have enough people vote against my execution. True. But Marie Antoinette was very charming. She apparently had a lovely singing voice. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I- I'm an awful singer, so that's not how I charm people. But you win some, you lose some. So would you vote to execute Marie Antoinette then? Yes. You would? See, I don't think personally I could do it. Like, I don't think I could ever just say I'm in favor of this person's execution. But at the same time, I can't blame other people for wanting her execution. I mean, she's been dead for 200 years, so... <laughs> no, I know, I know. I mean, but like, if, if today, like, you know, she's being led up the fucking stairs to the guillotine... Do you want to, like, step in front of the people and be like, no, not today or whatever? Well, I think, too, there's a difference. And we can even talk about this in relation to modern crime and punishment. But there's a difference between saying this person has done a really bad thing or lived a life in exploitation of other people. And I don't think that's okay. And I honestly don't really care personally what happens to them. But then also being opposed to execution or other criminal punishment in principle. Oh, yeah, I agree. I mean, again, I'm against execution in principle. I'm against the death penalty in principle. Um, And especially the way it's practiced today in terms of targeting, you know, individuals who are convicted of crimes that are, some of them are more abhorrent crimes, but also, you know, the the sort of the dysfunction of the justice system makes it such that a lot of people are innocent when they die and what have you. But at the same time, people like, who's someone I could say that I won't get into trouble for saying? Anders Breivik. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean... Anders Breivik, I guess, is there really a chance for rehabilitation for him? I don't think so. Even the Norwegians have given up on him. And that's the Norwegians. Yeah, that says a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So, I guess still complicated feelings about 
Marie Antoinette, but I just, I don't like her girl bossification. I don't like turning in her into this Instagram influencer personality. Yeah, it, it's just bizarre. And I think when we look back at her life, we actually should see her as a figure of gluttony and really question why that should ever be okay. Yeah. And, you know, at the same time, recognize that she was one of many nobles who were gluttonous and exploitative, and they all deserve the same fate. Like, you know, she wasn't special compared to like Louis XVI or any of the other aristocrats. She was just as gluttonous as they are. Yeah. So thank you guys for listening to our little podcast. If you like our content, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash doscriminal or on Instagram at doscriminalpod. Yeah, and hope you have a wonderful week, everyone. Until next time. Bye. Bye.